See, if you wait for somebody else to tell you, you may never hear it. You see? And some people can tell you today, but next week they may change their mind. So you can't trust anybody else to tell you that you're beautiful. You got to tell yourself that you're beautiful. All right? Say, I am beautiful. No matter what anybody thinks. Cool. See? So you know you more than anybody else knows you. Right? <laughs> okay. You know, some people stand in front of the mirror and they say, I don't know why my ear is like this. Why is my nose like this? Oh God, what is this? <laughs> love yourself. If you cannot love yourself, you cannot love anybody else. Love yourself. Then you can love others. All right? Before you can value anybody else, you must value yourself. Do you value yourself? All right. Now, that's a nice thought, but there's another one. He says, he had made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he had set the world in their heart. So that no man can find out the work that God make it from the beginning to the end. Well, a very complex construction there. Some of the some translations will say, and no man can find out. Alright? So not necessarily dependent on the previous one. But the point I want to show you there is just a little phrase where he says. Also, he had set the word in their hearts. Now, the Hebrew words that's translated there, uh, translated word there, is a Hebrew word, olam. Now, olam is used more than 270 times in the Bible. And 63 times of that, it is translated everlasting or eternity okay and then it is translated only four times as word so it is a stronger argument that it is used as eternity he had set eternity in the hearts rather than word which is used only four times and it's 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 king james who picks world here many others will use eternity he had set eternity in their hearts hey i don't know if you get this this is this is marvelous there are simple ideas that we can we can get from the word of god to understand why we should have an an awesomely wonderful life for example god made you is that okay you are the product of god you are the workmanship of god god made you now why should there be any defect in your body? Didn't God know the world in which you would live? Didn't he make you in such a way that you can function perfectly in the world where he was going to put you? I think he was smart enough. To do everything that he needed to do so that there'll be no problem with your heart, your lungs, your kidneys, your, your fingers, your bones, your, your uh, 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 nervous system. Nothing wrong with you. There has to be an outside force attacking you to make things change in your body. Hey, come on. Come on. Otherwise, the only thing that can go wrong is if you work against what the manual 
of the manufacturer has said. All right? The Bible is his manual, the manufacturer's manual. You can use that to guide your life. You can tell how you ought to go in your life. Because if you work against the word of God, you're going to have problems in your body. You're going to have problems in your spirit. But outside of that, there's no reason why there should be a malfunction. He had made everything beautiful in his time. It actually means perfect in his time. He's done it. Then, cuss, haya. This, this part of it is so beautiful when it says, and also he had set eternity. That means the time clock in your heart is not 40 years, it's not 30 years, it's not 70 years. God planned for man to live eternally. He set eternity in their heart. He set it. Whew. Hard to chew for many people. But it's true. He set eternity. He set it. He set it in your heart. <laughs> he chose for you to live eternally. In fact, scientists have said, scientists have said that they find no scientific reason for the human being to die. They don't know why human beings should die. Because the body renews itself every 7 to 11 years. Within every 7 to 11 years, every single cell in your body is replaced. From the tallest strand of hair on your head to the lowest cell under your feet. There's no cell in your body now that was there when you were born. Your whole body is a totally new body. Every 7 to 11 years, there's a renewal for everybody, every human being. So they find no scientific reason for death. They can't understand why people die. So when they say, well, um, the man died a natural death, if he was not killed, they can't understand why the man should die. They say out of old age. They, they can't understand why should anybody age to die. Because every cell in his body is changed. Within every 7 to 11 years. That's why the Bible says that death is an enemy. It's not natural. There's no natural death. There's no natural death. Didn't you read about... Moses in the Bible, he was 120 years old, and the Bible says his physical stature, his physical body was not abated. Neither did his eyes go dim. God had to tell him, Moses, go up to that mountain and die. Go and die. <laughs> then he climbed the mountain, lay down, and died. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. You still there? Glory to his name forever. He set eternity in their hearts. Somebody says, I woke up this morning. I'm, I'm, glory, I'm, 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 I'm grateful to God that I woke up. Ah, it's a miracle. It is a miracle if you don't wake up. <laughs> it is normal for you to wake up. The surprise will be if you didn't wake up. You are supposed to wake up. That's what's normal. Of course we are aware that people slept and didn't wake up. But the truth is, they are supposed to wake up. It is when they don't wake up we are amazed. Ah, you mean he slept and didn't wake up? But that you slept and woke up is perfectly natural with human beings. That's how you were made to be able to rest and wake up. All right? So when you want to go to sleep, don't be afraid. Say, oh God, I don't know. 
Okay. You know, there are people who are afraid to sleep. Hallelujah. He had set eternity in their hearts. Oh, glory to God. I could preach for a whole month in that. But I, I just wanted to refer to it so you can understand something that we want to talk about. We're dealing with the transcendent life. What did we say the transcendent life is? It's a super life. Beyond the range of ordinary perception. What a life. A life with preeminence, the exceptional life, beyond the ordinary. And that that's the life that Christ has given us. We don't try to attain it. I tell people, don't strive for excellence. Do excellent things. You don't strive for it, do excellent things. It means you do the right thing the first time. That's the way God has made you. Take advantage of these deposits in your spirit. Hallelujah. All right, now let's move to a beautiful scripture that is totally beyond the reach of empirical Christianity. All right? Beyond the consideration of rationalists. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Have you found it? Second Corinthians chapter 4. And I will read to you from verse 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Did you see that? For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory than the big one. Verse 18. Why we look not at the things which are seen, which is empiricism. You see that? For I will look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. <laughs> For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Hey, think about it. The natural man says, I believe when I see it. And that's a dumb thing. It doesn't work. How can you believe something you see? You can't believe what you see. Hello? Just like we asked the Wednesday night. How many of you believe I'm the one talking? How many of you believe I'm here? You believe I'm here? You do believe I'm here? How many of you believe I'm here? If you believe I'm here, raise your hand up. Raise your hand. Wave your hand like this. Come on. I'm yeah. How many of you believe I'm here? You believe I'm here, right? <laughs> Look at you. Can't you see me? <laughs> Don't you know I'm here? <laughs> you're looking at me and you still say, I believe you're here. No, but you see, it looks like mere semantics, but that's the way people really are. They say, if I see it, I'll believe it. How can you believe it after seeing it? 
You believe because you have not seen something. And you don't believe with your senses. The senses don't believe. They don't have the potentiality of believing. Your eyes don't see the look. They don't see. Didn't you know that? When you look with your eyes, you see with your mind. Didn't you know that? Haven't you seen people whose eyes are open but they can't see nothing? Their eyes are open but somebody still has to lead them by the hand, even though their eyes are open. In other words, even though they are looking and the picture registers, the mind cannot tell what it is. And that's why in many of such cases, the doctor can't help. Because he said, the eyes are perfect. Everything we can see is perfect. We can understand why he still can't see. He said, what's that? He sees shadows. Praise God. Amen. When you see something, you don't believe it. Because... Your senses have already interpreted its reality. So as far as the senses are concerned, that thing is real. It's already come to the sense realm. It has become part of sensical knowledge. All right? So it, it, it's not something you believe. You believe before your senses can understand or perceive something. And so, understand, your senses can't, can't believe. The Bible tells us very clearly, it's with the spirit that you believe. Your heart believes. You believe with your heart. Romans chapter 10 verse 10. For with the heart man believeth. Man believeth. With the heart. You believe with your heart. Your heart is your spirit. You believe with your spirit. You believe with your spirit. You believe with your spirit. Glory to God. Man has the capacity to believe. He believes with his spirit. Ah, oh, that's wonderful. So, in, in, the, in the 18th verse of the 4th chapter, 2 Corinthians, where we read, it says, While we look not at the things which are seen, we look not at the things which are seen. But at the things which are not seen. The very thing that the uh, empiricists and rationalists tell us not to do. They say that's impossible. And that's exactly what the Bible says to be done. We look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. We're talking about the transcendent life. In other words, we look beyond the things which are seen by the optical eyes. We look beyond the things that can be perceived by the senses. We look beyond them. And then we look at the things that cannot be seen. That means it is left for the esoteric community do you understand in other words there's a group of us that have been hand-picked by God to be able to understand at that level that's talking about us who have received the Holy Ghost the Bible says we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit which is of God. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Wow. And the next verse is, which things also we speak. Uh -huh. 
So when we see them, we see the unseen. To those at the natural plane of life, these things are not real. They can't see them. They only see the things that are seen. But we can look at those things that are not seen, that cannot be seen. All right? They can look at the things that their eyes can see. We can look at the things that the eyes cannot see. And the Bible says we are helped by the Holy Spirit to see those things, to know those things. It says we receive the Spirit of God that we might know the things. So without the Spirit of God, you cannot know those things. He didn't say that we might assume the things. He says that we might know. Now, let's go back to that 18th verse of the 4th chapter of 2 Corinthians. Can you read it fully? For the things which are seen are temporal. They are for a short time. They are subject to change. They cannot continue always. They are subject to change. <laughs> the things that are seen are subject to change. But the ones that are not seen are eternal. Praise God. Hallelujah. The transcendent life. So, what life should I live then? I should live the life that is beyond the senses. Beyond the ordinary plane of life. You know what the Bible says about those who live in the senses? Turn to second, the book of Romans chapter 9. Are you there? Read verse 8. I don't know what you're saying now. Romans chapter 9 verse 8. There are so many things inside. Okay. It says, that is, those who are the children of the flesh, that means the children of the senses, it says, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Thank you. Those who are children of the senses, the children of the flesh, meaning the senses, he says, these are not the children of God. But that the children of the promise, meaning the children of the word, are counted for the seed. Now, did you, I, I don't know how much you have studied in the word of God, but in, in, in Genesis, when you study the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve, the Bible tells us how that they had children. Do you remember Cain and Abel? You know what the Bible says about them? He says, Cain was of the evil one, the wicked one. And Abel was of God. How? He didn't, he didn't mean that Satan gave a child to, to Eve by the name of Cain. And God gave Abel. No. It had to do with their behavior. It had to do with their actions. And through their actions, God said that Cain was of the wicked one. How was he of the wicked one? He said because he hated his brother and killed him. And that that was the manifestation of the wicked one. Now here's the interesting thing. 
both of them were of the same parents. And God said that one was of the devil and one was of God. Now, when you understand the principle of the spirit, you begin to know why it was so. Their actions actually were based on the conditions of their spirits. In other words, their actions didn't make them of God or of the devil. It was the condition of their spirits. When you read in the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews, you come across the, the man Esau, whom the word talks about in Genesis, and says that Esau was a profane man and sold his birthright. So he didn't, he didn't sell his birthright to become profane, but because he was profane, he sold his birthright. So the reason Cain did what he did was because he was of the wicked one. Now, what does this tell us? We come back to this Romans chapter 9 verse 8. He says that the children of the flesh are not the children of God. In other words, that you were born naturally doesn't make you a child of God. That's what Jesus was talking about. That which is of the flesh is flesh. So, being born of the flesh is flesh. That means being born through the senses. To be a child of God, you have to be born of the Spirit. Meaning, being born of the Word of God. It says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God that liveth and abideth forever. To be born again is to be born through the Word of God. By receiving the Word of God into your heart and confessing the Lordship of Jesus Christ over your spirit you saw it. it says the children of the flesh are not the children of God but the children of the promise are counted for the seed the children of the promise what promise the word they are the ones that are counted for the seed which means God looks at this mass of humanity and he says that's of the promise that one and that one. You want to know who my children are? This and that and that and that. You see, these are the ones. Not everybody. Hallelujah. So, you cannot live your life on the basis of the senses. The Bible says, if we live according to the flesh, it's death. But to live according to the Spirit is life and peace. It is life and peace. Life and peace. Oh, how every one of us could enjoy a wonderful life. Every one of us. By living from the realm of the spirit. Living from our spirits. Superimposing the life of the spirit on our outward man. It says, though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more eternal weight of glory. Why we look not at the things which are seen. We don't consider the temporal nature around us. We look at the things that are not seen. They don't see the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. They don't see the reality of speaking in tongues. They can't see the power of it. They think it's foolish. In the 14th verse of the second chapter, 1 Corinthians, the Bible says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. They even laugh at you and say, Say, so you're speaking in tongues. 
They laugh at you. They say, you, you, you're so foolish. You think this. And you go, oh, talking like a baby. But that's where the power is. <laughs> that's where the power is. The Bible says, God has used foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Foolish things. So when you see us, you say, hey, look at them, look at them, they are stupid. Hey, th that's what you think, but that's where the power of God is. That's where it is. When we want to effect changes, changes in our lives or anything, in our jobs, and wherever. What do we do? From where we are, we are seen through the Spirit. Now, you see, when you understand the transcendent life, you will live permanently on the mountain. I said permanently. You live permanently on the mountain. There's a scripture I, I would like to read to you. Will you turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 3? Hallelujah to Jesus Christ. Sebra gosko shalamanda, legra hasoje brekte so praktalamanda. Hallelujah. I told you to go to Ephesians chapter 3. I want us to go all the way to verse 19. We've come through this before. Okay, let's read. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that he might be filled with all the fullness of God. And I remember sharing with you that the word fullness is translated from the word pleroma. All right? It, it had something. Now, in the Amplified, I want to read to you from the Amplified version so you can understand what this is. It's so powerful. That you may really come to know. I'm reading the Amplified version now. Now, Amplified doesn't mean adding something to it that was not there. It means just giving you all the right synonyms so you can understand exactly what it's talking about. Making it louder for you. My voice is being amplified to you right now. Is that correct? Okay. Are you hearing something different from what I'm saying? That you may really come to know practically through experience for yourselves the love of Christ which far surpasses mere knowledge that is knowledge without experience that you may be filled through all your being unto all the fullness of God that means that you may have the richest measure of the divine presence and become a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself That is God's will for us. Ah! Filled and flooded with God. He didn't say when we get to heaven. Now! This is God's plan. This is God's desire for you, for your everyday life. Filled and flooded with God. That you should have the richest measure of the divine presence. The richest measure of the divine presence. Hallelujah. Turn to Colossians. Let me show you something. Colossians chapter 2. <laughs> Mm. I want to read from verse 3, talking about Christ. And when it says Christ, it refers to all of us, okay? Christ, 
because we are the body of Christ. The Bible says Jesus is the head. All right? The church is his body. The head and the body are called Christ. Did you hear that? That's why we are in Christ. If any man be in Christ, by one spirit are we all baptized into the body, the body of Christ. We are in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. If you are in the body of Christ, you are a new creation. Do you understand it? All right. So this Christ that we are into. Hey. From verse 3. Don't forget, we have become the new man. In him, all the treasures of divine wisdom, comprehensive insight into the ways and purposes of God and all the riches of spiritual knowledge and enlightenment are stored up and lie hidden. Hello? Hi. Oh, you were reading King James at that time. Okay, where I'm going, I'm still taking you somewhere. Turn to verse 9. Read verse 9. Go on. Where do you come in there? Verse what? 9 and 10. Okay, let's read from verse 9. In him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But we just heard that God's plan is for us to be filled and flooded. With what? The richest measure of the divine nature. Look, the Bible says in Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead. Okay? In him is the fullness of the Godhead. What does that mean? That the Godhead expresses himself in totality in Christ in bodily form where is the body of Christ I said where is the body of Christ here look at you Jesus said if you have seen me you have seen the father Okay, why can't we talk like that? No, why can't we talk like that? No, 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 no. Why can't we talk like that? The Bible says so. Why can't we, why can't we say the same thing? We are afraid to believe it. Now let me tell you the principle of the Word of God. The principle is called the mirror principle. It's the principle of the New Testament. God has this principle that if you see what he shows you, you will be what he shows you. If you hear what he tells you, you will be what he tells you. Now, if God says, I told you why God cannot lie. If he says anything, it will become the truth. If God told you that this thing was red, hmm? if it was black, as you were looking at it and that's what god cannot lie if this thing were black as you were looking at it and you ask god lord what is the color of that thing and he said it is red now you can't say god that is not true it is black you know why the moment god says it is red it will turn red so before you can say that god has lied the thing that he said has become real so God cannot lie. 
The Bible says from everlasting to everlasting. That means from eternity to eternity, thou art God. That means when he says something, whether into the past, into the present, or into the future, it will be as God has said. If you were born in Kaduna, and the records of your birth were in Kaduna, and God said you were born in Sierra Leone. If he said so, if you went back to Kaduna, you will not find your documents. In other words, you are dealing with a God that has the power to change the past, to change the present, and to change the future. Do you understand what I'm talking about? We are talking about the power, the greatness of God. The past is not hidden from Him. The past is not unchangeable to God. Human beings cannot change the past. Human beings cannot even alter the future because they don't even know the future. But you're dealing with... Summer 